What are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the settings I adopted in my review as my test settings. So these were suitable on my unit according to my own preferences and according to the colour limiter targets I generally go for when I'm reviewing monitors. Individual units and preferences will vary. The first setting of interest is variable refresh rate. Just make sure that's enabled if you want to use VRR technologies such as AMD FreeSync and NVIDIA G-Sync compatible. You'll want to consider the preset of the monitor. They're called game visual modes. I'd recommend either using user mode or racing mode. They're really the best configured. Some of the other modes have some odd filters like oversaturation and wonky gamma, which you can't correct by changing things in the OSD. Racing mode and user mode both give a very good base. And if you set them up in the same way, they'll look exactly the same. I'm just using user mode here. I'd like to use racing mode for the factory default settings just for comparative purposes in the review. Next, you'll want to go to image, brightness. I've set this to 54 and that got close to my usual target of 160 nits, which I go for for consistency in my reviews. This is suitable for my lighting environment and my own preferences, but please do set this according to your own preferences. And there's also a feature called uniform brightness associated with that. I like to keep this on because I like the consistent experience. If you prefer higher brightness, but don't mind this sort of dynamic contrast experience where the brightness is going to keep adjusting according to the image displayed, then you could disable uniform brightness. Be aware that anything I'm not mentioning here was left at default in the user setting and that includes the contrast being set to 80. There's an OLED anti-flicker setting which I like to set to middle. This is all explored in the review. Depending on the refresh rate range that you're experiencing on your game you might find off or potentially high better so feel free to experiment yourself but I think middle is a nice comfortable setting. Next we're going to colour. Display colour space. I like this set to wide gamut to use the full native gamut of the monitor, the full vibrancy potential. With that said, sRGB might be the optimal setting for some people which tones down the saturation and gives more appropriate output for most content which is created within the sRGB colour space. I do explore the sRGB emulation of the monitor separately in the review. I like to explore the full wide gamut performance as well. And if you select sRGB here, it doesn't lock you out of any of the other settings. There's an alternative sRGB emulation setting which some people might want to use, and that is another game visual preset, sRGB Cal mode. This was pretty tightly calibrated on my unit, but it's not as flexible as the sRGB color space setting. For example, you can't access the color menu, so you can't change your color channels. So if you want the flexibility, just stick to user mode, display color space sRGB. Or if you want to use the full native gamut, perhaps you want things more vibrant, you're actually working within a wider color space, you could select one of the other options instead, like wide gamut, which I'm using here. I also made a few tweaks in color temp. I set this to user red 100, green 98, blue 100. That got close to 6500k on my unit with a well-balanced green channel as well. So that's what I changed under SDR. I made sure variable refresh rate was enabled, set game visual to user mode, brightness 54, uniform brightness enabled, OLED anti-flicker set to medium, display colour space left at wide gamut, and colour temp set to user red 100, green 98, blue 100. Again, be aware that individual units will vary in this respect. Now to enable HDR in Windows and talk about my HDR settings. I must preface this section by stating that the experiences I share here apply to my unit and my system. Things can vary based on different GPUs or systems, and even between units. Based on past models from ASUS, there can be some inconsistencies with how the HDR settings behave. For example, sometimes changes are made in different firmware. My unit has MCM101 for reference, and I'm using an NVIDIA RTX 5090. If you go to Image HDR setting, that's where you get your HDR presets. You'll see Game Visuals now greyed out, so that doesn't apply under HDR. If you wish to customise the HDR experience, make sure Adjustable HDR is enabled. When you enable that, you'll get a message there that says the PQ EOTF curve of the monitor will be affected when you activate the setting, so its HDR calibration is affected, though the effect is minor unless you make changes from there to the settings that are unlocked. Various settings are unlocked for you. You can adjust the brightness, contrast, and you also have various colour temperature presets and your colour channels available. Just be aware that changes to the colour channels will reduce the brightness potential of the monitor and could affect calibration elsewhere. Slight changes and rebalances are fine, but try to avoid huge changes there. I generally recommend increasing brightness to 100 for the high brightness HDR modes. It's set to 90 by default there, which improves luminance output under HDR. It doesn't do anything funky with saturation levels like I've seen on some ASUS models with this setting adjusted. For the best calibrated HDR True Black 400 experience, just leave this at 80. I like to use the Windows HDR calibration tool to help give an idea of the relative brightness calibration for HDR on monitors with various modes and settings. In-game calibration sliders, they should show similar behaviour, 
though that can depend on the game and how they've set the HDR calibration options up. Just remember this tool gives an indication of the relative calibration of the screen, not the actual brightness levels you'll experience. Note that the brightness levels reported here in any HDR mode, they're not affected by adjustable HDR being enabled or the brightness level set. So what you've set the brightness of the monitor to, in other words. The Display HDR True Black 400 setting that provides a consistent and relatively well calibrated experience, but with limited peak brightness. That's what I've got the monitor set to at the moment. It's limited to a brightness of around 450 nits when set to a brightness of 80, which is what I've got it set to at the moment and what the mode is calibrated for. The 450 nit calibration is also reflected in this test. I do ideally like to see a close match like this between the actual brightness output and how it's reported in calibration processes like this. Using gaming HDR, the tool reports brightness at around 950 nits whereas the monitor can output around or slightly beyond 1,200 nits using this or indeed the cinema HDR or console HDR settings. This is difficult to see in the video, no doubt, but I've switched over to cinema HDR and the tool reports around 1,020 nits now. So that comes a bit closer to the actual brightness output of the screen, though it's still not quite matching it. As for console HDR, which I've now switched over to, That's reporting around 750 nits, and that's significantly lower than the 1200 nits or a bit beyond which the monitor is actually capable of. In practice, I didn't find the high brightness HDR settings gave a dramatically different experience to one another once calibrated appropriately in game or using the Windows HDR calibration tool. Calibrating appropriately is usually pretty straightforward if the calibration includes a nice visual guide like the Windows tool or some in-game calibrations. But remember that any in-game maximum brightness figures should be set to around 950 nits for gaming HDR, 1020 nits for cinema HDR, 750 nits for console HDR. At least that was correct as I perceived things on my unit. If you watch a lot of HDR movie content or you play games that don't have an in-game HDR calibration facility or a poor one, and you want to use one of these high brightness HDR modes, it's probably worth running through the Windows HDR calibration tool and using the profile it creates for HDR. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider running the game under HDR, so it's a little bit more interesting to look at than the Windows HDR calibration tool. Because of how ASUS has calibrated the monitor under HDR, it does tend to over brighten already bright shades and also some medium bright shades using its high brightness HDR modes. It's slightly reduced if you keep the brightness at 90 or you don't enable adjustable HDR. Provided the in-game or Windows HDR calibration is appropriately set up, this thankfully isn't sufficient to cause huge crushing of highlight detail. Though it can affect subtle distinctions in very bright gradients. Generally though, the most noticeable effect is really just going to be extra pop to already bright elements. I settled for the cinema HDR setting which as you'll recall got closest on my unit to the actual brightness capability of the screen with its reported luminance. I also found this mode generally performed the best in terms of giving elements that should be very bright in many scenes strong brightness levels. In some scenes it had a bit of an edge over the other high brightness HDR modes in that respect, in other scenes they were pretty similar really. So to recap, my preference for a high brightness HDR experience is cinema HDR, adjustable HDR enabled, brightness set to 100, and if you need to make slight adjustments to the colour channels on your unit, you can do that. Just make sure they're not extreme adjustments, as you will be reducing your brightness if you do that. But some people will prefer that Display HDR 400 True Black mode. I'm on another scene on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, just to quickly mention another setting that may be of interest to some people. And that's called Dynamic Brightness Boost. As it says there, the PQ curve is affected if you have this set to on. Really what it does is it boosts up a lot of shades so that they're brighter than intended. This does crush together highlight detail more, and it makes a lot of shades just uplifted in a way that they shouldn't be if you want accurate output. If you're in a particularly bright room, perhaps this setting would be useful for helping you make out little details. Perhaps you're looking at HDR content where you really want to look at finer details and you're finding them too masked without this setting. That's really the use case I can see for this, but generally, if you want a more accurate looking and really more atmospheric HDR image, then I would leave this disabled. So it's enabled at the moment, and that's disabled. So there's a lot more depth now. And just another scene showing this setting just for what it's worth. It's disabled here, and now it's enabled. Back to SDR now, just a few more settings I'd like to go through. OLED Care. These screensaver options, they will dim parts of the screen selectively. To be completely honest with you, I'm not entirely sure what the difference between screen dimming control and global dimming control is. 
the outer dimming control is a bit more obvious. What that does is it selectively dims the outer edges of the screen and gives you a kind of vignetting effect. I don't like any of these settings because I don't like to limit the brightness potential of the monitor and I also don't like to introduce really artificial bad uniformity issues which you just wouldn't expect from an OLED like this. What I will say is that with all of these options, worth having a go with them and seeing if you find them fine. And if you do, just leave them enabled. If you don't, then disable them. You might notice that I just have quite a few of these disabled. That's for the purposes of the review and according to my own preferences. There's pixel cleaning. That's the pixel cleaning cycle. So the usual voltage shifts which occur on OLEDs to try and help mitigate image retention. Regardless of what you have the pixel cleaning reminder setting set to, I've got this set to off because it gives you a little pop-up message after two hours, four hours or eight hours. Regardless of what you set the pixel cleaning reminder setting to, so I've got it set to off, it will try and run the pixel cleaning cycle after a cumulative, I believe it's six hours of use. I'm not sure exactly. It seems to be slightly different, maybe between six and eight hours. But after a certain period of cumulative use, and that's when you're not using the monitor, and specifically when it goes into standby. And that will occur if you shut down your PC or if Windows Power Management tells your screen to switch off. It doesn't seem to run if you press the power button of the monitor, and it certainly won't run if you disconnect the power from the monitor. It does need power flowing to the monitor to actually run. So to be on the safe side, and I know most people generally do this anyway, just switch the system off, let the screen naturally go into standby, and it should run the cycle. If you go to OLED usage info at the bottom there, you'll be able to see if it's run the cycle. So pixel clean interval is how long after it's last run the cycle. So I've been quite naughty here. I've had it running for 11 hours without running the cycle. I've just been very busy with the review, so I haven't actually let it run its cycle. And another thing is that I like to use the Neo Proximity sensor. I'm just gonna quickly show you this. I have it set to max 90 centimeters. That works for me and where I sit generally, but you can have 60, 90, 120, or you can have it set to tailored mode if you want to adjust the distance yourself. Anyway, this is a really neat feature. Depending on what you've got screen offset to, five minutes, 10 minutes, or 15 minutes, the screen will indeed blank out after this time has elapsed. It worked really well when I was using it, reliably blanked out the pixels, and when I returned to the screen, it very quickly came back to life. I like to use this feature, but it won't allow the pixel cleaning cycle to run on its own. You do actually need to use Windows Power Management to turn the screen off after a given amount of time, or you have to have your system switched off so the screen goes into standby to actually run the pixel cleaning cycle. I would have preferred if it was able to run with the Neo Proximity sensor, but at least the way they've done it is very consistent. You know that when you return to the monitor, it will very quickly spring back to life. So the last two settings here, screen move. I'm happy with this set to middle. Don't have an issue with it. I don't notice it, don't find it annoying. There's an active area around the image between the panel border and the image, which the image can bounce around in. So it just shifts itself up, down, left or right slightly. And this is the typical image retention mitigation measure that OLEDs do employ. You can have this set to strong if you don't notice that, you know, that gives you the best potential protection. But I wouldn't stress too much about this. I think middle is perfectly fine and even light if you're finding this particularly annoying or if even light's too much for you, then you could have it set to off. But basically strong will be bouncing around the most. Middle less than that, light less again and off won't be doing it at all. There's auto logo brightness. So this is a logo detection feature or taskbar detection feature, which will selectively dim certain elements of the screen. So logo detection is designed to dim small buttons or small elements of the screen, small static elements. And taskbar detection is designed to dim taskbars. Certainly useful features. If I wasn't reviewing the monitor, I might actually even have these enabled. I think the way that they've implemented this feature is fairly unobtrusive. It seems to work well. I have tested it out a little bit. I also like to talk a little bit about visibility enhancement. So if you want a competitive edge in games and you want enemies to be more visible in dark areas, for example, a few ways to achieve that on this model. You might like to use the FPS mode. I've got Legom open, by the way, Legom.nl, the black levels test to try and highlight some of the differences this makes. Although you won't be able to see exactly what I see by eye. So it gives a good uplift to a lot of the darker shades and actually a lot of shades in general. It also oversaturates, so it does quite a lot. You might like how this looks, you might find it useful, in which case it's fine, you can use it. If not, return to your usual settings, so user mode in my case, and you could use Shadow Boost. So level one, level two, and level three, they actually give a rather subtle effect, at least for the darker shades I'm looking at here. 
Dynamic Shadow Boost is supposed to look at the content and adjust according to that, and it does have a more noticeable effect. But what I would say is that the darkest shades here, they remain rather well masked with the background, so perhaps that's not giving you the best boost. Alternative ways to really boost even the darkest shades here up. Well, there's your gamma setting in color. You could set this to 1.8. That does give a nice boost, although the darkest shades aren't quite as uplifted as they could be. And it's actually going to affect all of your shades other than black and white when you change the gamma setting. The best way of uplifting this detail is actually to use the sRGB Cal mode. And that's because it uses sRGB rather than linear 2.2 as the gamma target. So that selectively uplifts these very dark shades, makes them more visible, but it will also reduce your saturation levels. So there are a few different options here to get a competitive edge. It's really up to you which, if any, you use. And last but perhaps not least, although yeah, for me it kind of is least, but I know some people like to see this anyway, and I don't want people to complain that I haven't shown them. There are crosshairs on this monitor in Game Plus, various different designs, blue or green dots or crosses of various sizes. You can also adjust its position on the screen. You can adjust it to anywhere on the screen. Although there isn't an option to automatically recenter it, so you'd have to adjust it yourself. I don't use it, so I don't really care if it's not right in the middle. But if you're really annoyed and frustrated, you've changed where it is on the screen, I guess you could do a factory reset of the monitor. And that will, of course, erase your settings, but also will recenter your crosshair if you've accidentally off-center adjusted it and you didn't want to. And there's dynamic crosshair. You'll see that the colors have disappeared now, although the designs are still there. But what this will do is it will try to contrast with whatever the background shade is. I wouldn't say it's doing a particularly good job here, it's sort of going for a muted green against a more saturated green. It seems to always be that shade. That's interesting. I thought this would change according to the shades being displayed, but it doesn't seem to actually do that. So maybe it's bugged on my unit? Interesting. Well, I don't really care about the crosshair, so I'm not going to investigate this further, but that's very interesting. And I'm just going to leave it at that.